<laughs> so it looks like there's anyone have any questions just post it in the chat group now um if there's not then what we'll do is move on to pierre who's going to be um talking about compartment syndrome so no nope, no questions so whoever you want to take it away uh there is one question both guidelines for uk or america they're for uk yeah they're, they're uk guidelines but the treatment principles are, are broadly the same across the world hi can everyone see my screen mm. uh, no. not yet uh, there we go you can yep it's all up there you can how do i this is really embarrassing i hate max <laughs> i've lost access to my um microsoft office really recently Basically, press, uh, press, press hit play, play. yeah press yeah play. Press play 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 play, uh, play. No, across the top left. row on the left left, left. top row yeah, on the left, left. no yes. yeah That's it was being one. it was being nice. hidden by something okay <laughs> Jesus. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as I said before, my name is Pierre Sinclair. I'm one of the uh, SD3s just finishing out the Royal London. And I'm going to try and cover some key points about acute compartment syndrome. There's going to be some nuances, uh, which gives you the more points at interview. Um, I'll try and point out how to find more about it. But I think in the context of sort of a 15, 20 minute presentation, there's only so much we can cover. Um, and thanks to the Fundamental of Orthopedics uh, crew who invited me to talk this evening. There's three things I want you guys to take away really. Um, firstly is to understand what compartment syndrome is. Uh, secondly is how, how would you intervene if you found someone you suspected had com acute compartment syndrome. And then I'd just like to cover some primary prevention. How do you uh, reduce the risk of someone developing a compartment syndrome? I'm just going to give you a couple of cases to hopefully try and make a point. Um, so the first case is 39 year old Romanian speaking uh, man who's playing football around 7 p.m. Uh, this happened to a friend of mine. Uh, the patient stepped on the football, twisted his right knee and fell over, but he didn't directly impact his knee. And he was a transfer from a different hospital. He was sort of average build. So BMI would have been 25 ish. Um, and the only background history was some kind of skin condition for which he used a topical steroid. And he had a road traffic accident after a motorbike collision five years prior for which he was treated with cannulated screws. And compare this with the second case, also there being a language barrier. So this guy's Portuguese uh, from a different hospital. He was riding his motorcycle around 20 miles per hour and uh, he lost control and hit the edge of a curb and fell directly onto his right knee. And these are the images. It was similar sort of build, so maybe a BMI of 24 and otherwise fit and well. So moving on to acute compartment syndrome. So the both guidelines um, describe it as raised pressure within an osteofascial uh, compartment causing local tissue ischemia and hypoxia. Uh, so I just need to minimize this. Um, there are different causes, so you can think of it as increased pressure within the compartment itself, which might be caused by bleeding or extravasation of uh, fluids. And burns is quite an important cause of compartment syndrome. And then extrinsic causes, so uh, tight compressive uh, bandages. And actually, Ben will probably remember when we were on our ski trip in our second year, one of our colleagues uh, was developing a compartment syndrome because she, her ski boots were too tight, for example. And what actually happens in compartment syndrome is there's an increased pressure for those causes mentioned, which actually overcome the pressure within the capillaries that supply the muscles and nerves, basically tissue within the compartment. And then you get an increase in um, uh, hydrostatic pressure. So there's, there's sort of a backflow of blood. And there's a difference between intravascular and extra um, sort of interstitial pressure. And you get more fluid leakage into the uh, interstitial compartments. And it's just a vicious cycle where you get, eventually the pressure rises and starts to compress the venules and the veins. And this all happens way before it starts to compress um, the arteries within that compartment. So that's why you can still feel pulses in someone who's actually developed compartment syndrome. There's a paper by McQueen 
so there was a retrospective study done uh, from guys in Scotland, which looked at the risk factors. And they found that if you've had a tibial diaphyseal fracture, high energy soft tissue injury, um, or distal radius or diaphyseal uh, forearm fractures, you're more likely to develop compartment syndrome. And they found it tended to affect younger adults and those who are male, possibly because their behaviors are higher risk. But why do we actually care about compartment syndrome? Well, actually it can have some devastating complications. So you can get uh, muscle death, which uh, especially in the forearm can lead to ischemic uh, Volkmann contractures, uh, leading to paralysis, loss of function in the limb affected. The muscle breakdown can release myoglobin and eventually cause rab rhabdomyolysis. So you get acute renal failure and you get nerve death. So you can either get chronic pain or some uh, painful neuropathies or numbness. So it's very important to spot these uh, and recognize it. And so typically you wanna look for the three Ps really, and they're all pain. So pain out of proportion of what's expected from the injury, especially if, if you've immobilized them and given them pain relief. Pain despite giving them increasing amounts of analgesia and pain of, uh, on passive stretch of the muscles involved within that compartment. There's other ways of recognizing compartment syndrome that you need to know about as part of both guidelines. So compartment pressure monitoring, particularly relevant in patients who are intubated or patients where you're not quite sure whether or not it could be a compartment syndrome. And you're looking for a difference in pressure um, between the diastolic blood pressure and the intracompartment pressure of around 30, milli uh, 30 millimeters of mercury or an absolute intracompartment pressure of over or equal to 40 millimeters of mercury. So if we look at the uh, Romanian guy again, um, a few hours later when he was transferred into a hospital, uh, sorry, he required two, milli uh, two milligrams of IV morphine during the transfer and 10 milligrams within an hour of being in our emergency department. And when uh, my friend, my colleague spoke to the patient, he was complaining of some pain, examined him and he already had his above knee back slab in situ. Uh, so it was split, partly to assess the soft tissues of the knee um, and feel the pulses in his feet. There was no swelling or blistering. He had some hypersensitivity if you run your fingers over uh, where the fracture site was. There was reduced but present deep proud kneel sensation and otherwise normal function of his EHL and EDL, which is all you could test while he's in his back slab. There were no phone calls during the night about this patient. And during the ward round, when the consultant went around, he had very very tense compartments, which are incredibly tender to touch. And so he was taken to theatre. Case two, who you might argue had a higher energy injury, um, required six, uh, six milligrams of IV morphine uh, on arrival to our a &E department. Otherwise, he was relatively comfortable at rest. He as well had his above knee back slab in situ, normal sensation, able to move his toes, good pulses. His feet were very cold and he had a capillary refill time between six, uh, five and six seconds. His pain was six out of 10 in severity. So the nurses gave him off and didn't call the doctors overnight. He was comfortable during his bed uh, during the ward round and his pain was well controlled. So when you get essentially case one, you wanna manage it as Ben was trying to emphasize, um, depending on the clinical situation. So if you suspect it in, uh, as part of your trauma, you'd manage it as per ATLS principles. If they're on the ward, you manage it as per uh, CRISP. And also you'd mention that you'd manage it as BOA standards for trauma for compartment syndrome. Um, the non-operative non management uh, would include removing all circumferential dressings down to skin. You wanna elevate that limb, whichever limb's in affected to the level of the heart. And you wanna reevaluate re that patient within 30 minutes. You gotta make sure they're have had decent analgesia as well. They could be in pain, have not had anything at all. When you see them again, if you're convinced that they are developing compartment syndrome or have developed, um, despite all your efforts, you need to make that decision to operate. And that involves discussion with your consulting colleague. Okay. And the management, as Ben mentioned, would be a two incision, four compartment decompression uh, with regards to decompressing the compartments in the leg. So your posterior medial incision would be decompression of your posterior compartments, so both the superficial and deep posterior compartments. 
and your anterior lateral incision decompresses your anterior and lateral compartments. So in terms of um, primary prevention of this, these cases, I would seriously consider removing the, uh, the back slab or at least all the bandages uh, if you haven't done it yourself or a member of your team that you trust has done it. Um, not only just to assess the soft tissues and to clinically assess the compartment syndrome, but also open fractures. As Ben said, you have to look all around the limb to make sure they've not missed anything. And I personally removed back slabs and found open fractures where they were reported not to have done. And we had a recent uh, case where there was an open fracture that's been there for a week, not knowing. You want to, so that's your look. You want to feel, you want to palpate your compartment. So in a back slab, you can palpate the anterior and possibly the lateral compartments. You might want to loosen it a little bit around the fracture site so you can squeeze around the, the back if you're concerned about the posterior compartments. And you want to comment on what it feels like. Is it soft or is it hard or woody and it's very tender? So when my colleague rubbed his fingers up across that patient's anterior compartment and the patient was very hypersensitive, that could be an early indication that this, they're about to develop a compartment syndrome. And you want to move the involved muscles. So once again, within a back slab, you're mostly able to test the anterior and deep posterior compartments by essentially moving the toes. You want to manage them exactly the same way. So you get your imaging and you want to make sure that they're in really good positions, that the, whatever fracture it is or dislocation is really well reduced and really nicely splinted. Um, and that not only reduces the risk of compartment syndrome, but actually reduces the risk of adverse effects to the soft tissues. So it might reduce the amount of blistering that occurs or skin necrosis. You want to elevate that limb to the level of the heart to reduce the uh, soft tissue swelling. And you, as per both guidelines, you want to maintain a normal blood pressure so you can get a normal tissue perfusion. And that's basically a whistle-stop tour for compartment syndrome. And those are the three things I want you to take away. For your nuances, you want to read your both guidelines, so compartment syndrome management, as well as open fractures. But also, um, in my interview, I was asked about how to decompress the forearm. So it's worth looking up at least the forearm as well as the lower limb. And that's it.